Penpower is a certified benefit corporation, and we are working in places that don't have equal access to electricity. I launched the company six years ago in Haiti, and we've been working with local entrepreneurs, businesses, and organizations to get them off of diesel generators and onto reliable, renewable energy with energy storage. So creating a green revolution and a green economy in a place where 70% of the population doesn't have access to electricity. Wow. And um, we right now are looking at working with Native American tribes for renewable energy sovereignty and climate justice. As you mentioned, gender empowerment is a, um, a very important component of that for me. This transition that's happening right now into the clean energy economy and into drawing down carbon and reversing climate change needs to be a just transition. The communities that are on the front lines experiencing the worst impacts of climate instability are those who have contributed to the least and benefited from the least mm. the combustion of fossil fuels into carbon emissions and so it's really important that solutions be led by frontline communities and we can see a lot of innovation coming from those front lines in looking at your bio and and what you've been doing with your career uh, it's all related around energy in, in one way or another. How, how You have to help me understand what, where that interest comes from. Well, I've been interested ever since I learned about global warming as a little kid in the 90s in helping to solve this existential problem that we have not only for the survival of our own species, but for the majority of other species on planet Earth. We're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction right now. And it's the first extinction to my knowledge, that is being consciously created by a single species, human beings. And so I think as aware creators of this destruction, it's really up to us to, to reverse it, do something about it, not just to save our own hides, but to preserve this incredible thing known as life on planet Earth that we haven't been able to witness as far as we can see in the galaxy in every single direction. And um, and so, so in my passion to be an agent of reversing climate change within my lifetime, I arrived at energy as the place where I wanted to focus my, my own energy, um, sure. looking at where the bulk of emissions in society come from. So most emissions come from the built environment, be it construction right. of buildings, the electricity that's consumed by buildings, um, shortly followed by transportation. And, um, and so if we really want to tackle the lion's share of emissions, starting with the built environment and how electricity is generated and provided to buildings is a good place to tackle, as well as electrification of the transportation system and the greening of all electricity. We've had lots of conversations along that exact line uh, over the past, what, 85 episodes now. So we, we and I appreciate this, this a unique lens to look at it. One of the things I just heard yesterday uh, on the New Yorker radio hour was about um, this lack of a, a global organization that's looking to solve this problem. Like, this is a global problem. It's not a US problem or China problem or, or whatever. And, and I got the sense in listening to it that we weren't gonna be able to have the coordinated massive global change necessary because of the lack of that. And there was so many silos being counterproductive. I'm curious what your take is on that. Yeah, it's frustrating, especially on the heels of COP26 right now, right. seeing that, that we've been able as countries as nation states to, to come together to form a UN and, and to have these decision-making conferences, but we're still not able to create binding decisions. So we have these optional national commitments. And if you tally up all of the optional national commitments that came out of COP26, we're still looking at 2.7 degrees Celsius of warming, which is horrific. If you, if you read the last IPCC right. report on what 1.5 versus two looks like, two degrees warming, we're seeing increasing storm systems, you know, absolutely terrible climate devastation, the complete annihilation of entire nations that are at sea level. And, and so thinking about 2.7 degrees is, is absolutely unacceptable and unfathomable. So, so I think it's really up to all of us collectively to act, no matter where you are in, in terms of your 
method of participating in the system, whether whether you are a UN delegate or a local politician, a citizen, you know, an artist, a business person, a, a public sector employee, being being able to move the needle within your sector is crucial because we need every single person, every single bit of talent on board. <sighs> It, it we've talked a lot on the show about what what we can do as individuals because a lot of times as individuals we get frustrated um, that we we're not making a difference you know my w whatever it is yet collectively hopefully on on this platform and think having conversations like this we have more and more we get a bit of a butterfly effect and 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 that will happen so that's good let's talk about what you're doing. Um, and the way I understand it is that you're empowering local people in Haiti to be able to install renewable energy and be able to kind of build out this infrastructure uh, under your guidance, your organization's guidance. Do I have it mostly right? Yeah, so the first thing that we did in Haiti is we started interviewing local business owners, local solar installers to see why in this place that gets 360 sunny days per no year, kidding. there was not already a vibrant solar economy. And we heard the same things over and over again, that the missing pieces were access to capital. So basic finance, there's yeah. not a solar loan facility here in the United States, we have the ITC, the, the tax credit, which enables people to basically pay zero down for solar and think of what credit has enabled, you know, hardly anybody buys a house without a mortgage or cars without car payments. And so, so it's really enabled entire blossoming of industries. And so um, one of the big components of what we're doing in Haiti is offering finance for people to be able to pay back their solar installation month over month. Um, because they're experiencing those diesel generator gasoline savings month right. over month. And the other component that we've realized that we need to provide as we've grown in the marketplace is capacity building. So helping with international engineering codes and standards training. We've launched a women's solar installer training program. We've hired several people from that program and our partners, our local partners have hired several women from that program. And, um, and so, so it's really great seeing the marketplace grow. Um, we installed a couple of years ago, solar and energy storage for UNICEF Haiti. And at the time, it was the largest type of installation of that nature on any UNICEF base in the entire world. So demonstrating that places like Haiti, which are, are considered least developed nations, can actually be leaders in terms of right. adopting sustainable and regenerative technologies is a big component of what we do. And actually, in one of the latest UN bids that just came out, we saw gender as a component no in, um, in the solar installation crews. So, so having our little nudging influence on these large scale organizations. I, uh, I, it, it reminds me that what has come up in several conversations is the idea of climate finance and that that, that has been an issue. You, you made the point, we didn't have the, the boon in, in home buying until we have a mortgage industry and now we're not going to have the boon in in this electrification that we need until we have the finance behind that. Are you seeing? We had someone last week who's been was at the World Bank for thirty years. Is the World Bank doing anything about that? I should have asked her. Now they think about it. So the World Bank actually has a facility right now for funding microgrids in Haiti, which is super exciting. Oh. Because renewable energy microgrids enable communities to get access to electricity. And we are in, um, in close conversation with an organization that's been, been doing great work in the trenches in Haiti for the last decade called EarthSpark International. And um, they've been building microgrids, just raising philanthropic dollars. And finally, we're seeing some international support from the World Bank, from the Green, Green Climate Fund. And I firmly believe that there should be subsidies in these places that are hard to reach you know, where, where people are using very little electricity, but as they get access to power, there'll be a virtuous cycle where people are able to start right. businesses and start participating in global markets, and they'll be able to use more electricity. And if it's green electricity, then bagging <laughs> problem, no problem, yeah. as we say in Creole. So, yeah. um, so having having these international facilities and available for finance and mm. having subsidies mm. available for right. communities that, that have been left behind is incredibly important in kickstarting these markets. 
One of the things that, that comes to mind, we just, um, I'm not sure when our audience is listening to this talk, but we just had the largest series of tornadoes run through the southeastern United States. And Haiti is frequently on the list of getting slammed by hurricanes during hurricane season. Um, is solar easier? This is just me not knowing. Is solar easier to harden as a utility than others? So after Hurricane Maria and um, after after the storms in Puerto Rico, the Rocky Mountain Institute came out with a series of papers on what works and what doesn't in oh. terms of technology installation. Oftentimes there are um, you know specs and ratings yeah. for certain wind speeds, but but when they're really put to the test, which technologies and which mounting techniques are are actually right. hurricane resistant or can withstand you know 200 mile an hour winds um obviously you can't do anything about debris coming in smacking into the solar panels right. um depending on what the theft probability is in the market you could install easy to take out solar panels so if there's a storm coming you could remove the panels um now that we're doing larger and larger off-grid um, off-grid, standalone, microgrids, things like that. The bulk of the cost is actually on the energy storage and inverter side. And those pieces of equipment would be housed within um, a, a bunker or a shed or their own separate building. And, um, and so the panel cost has been coming down exponentially. Right. Right. So the panels are really one of the smallest line items on your entire budget. And, um, and so the higher cost items typically would be protected in the event of a storm, but definitely building in um, precautions, um, insurance, any, any type of, um, of protection that you can for for that is important because it's it's really hard to predict when and where storms are going to land yeah i wish we could um on the storage side i want to talk about storage uh in uh the second week of january we have the head of energy storage solutions from sandia national labs on the show so he's the guy one of the guys for the government looking how do we solve this at scale he said there's probably only a thousand of him in the world uh, who are looking at that specific problem. I'm curious, because um, you've said storage a couple of different times, that feels like, again, with so much energy because of the sunshine, that the requirement on the storage is is almost bigger than the, the collecting. Definitely, and grid-scale energy storage is kind of the big nut to crack when it comes to going 100% right. renewables, because right. renewables generate intermittently the sun, rises and falls and so yeah. pv rises and falls wind is mostly at night but it's it's hard to predict when you're going to get a lot of wind energy um tidal and hydro can be more predictable but especially with increasing water instability you know a, a lot of large hydro which is not only environmentally destructive um but is also increasingly volatile with droughts um is not as is not that base load that it used to be you know providing the the round the clock uh, predictable power that that you need to to ensure that you can keep your systems running at night and so so energy storage, low cost, widely available, non-toxic batteries are, are going to be a big driver in the adoption of global renewable energy and helping us get to 100% clean energy. And it's exciting to see a lot of technology coming out of the labs. I'm, um, I'm really thrilled to hear that um, you're going to have somebody from Sandia on this call. They're running um, a number of programs right now with the Biden administration, including an energy justice storage initiative, which um, we're looking at with a number of tribes. And, and so once again, seeing how technology can, can really be adopted the fastest on the front lines. This is a prime example. You know, 14% of Native American communities in the United States do not have access to electricity still. Electricity, really? running water, basic sewage and sanitation. Yeah, this is a perpetuation of environmental racism that our country was founded on. And, and so looking at communities that have basically no access to resources, where are the places that are most likely to adopt full suite cutting edge renewable energy solutions? Mm, mm, you know, people who mm. already have a grid and who are comfortably subsisting on coal-fired power plants at night, natural gas, right. spinning reserves, right? We don't have that incentive. But if you look at a rural community, Native American reservation, where people are paying five to 10 times per kilowatt hour and are in danger of having their energy shut off during the winter 
and having to burn fuel inside to survive through the night, people are going to be much more incentivized to adopt renewable energy technology, energy storage. And so we're really excited about helping that transition happen while creating local jobs, helping people on reservations to be able to participate in building a green economy so that we're not re-entrenching those extractive relationships that the energy industry has had with tribes throughout history. Sandra, I am, I am, you are a bundle of energy yourself. I am so glad that you're, you and your crew are working on this problem. Thank you so much.